Welcome to the show, Brain Health Unchaining Your Pain. I am really, really excited to be hosting this show live with Dr. Craig Shimazaki, who joins me on the show today. Welcome to the show, Craig. Thank you, Dr. Allen. A pleasure to be here today. <laughs> so for those that don't know Dr. Craig Shimazaki, he's a scientist like myself, an inventor with a passion to translate scientific and medical discoveries into acutely needed products so that more patients can live longer, healthier lives. He's co-founder and CEO of Molecular Labs, a neuroimmunology precision medicine company focused on identifying the underlying root causes of neurological, psychiatric and behavioral disorders triggered by autoimmune response. He has spent over 35 years working in the fields of molecular biology, viral pathogenesis, and infection triggered neuropsychiatric disorders. So he has an absolute breadth of experience and I'm really looking forward to the um, wisdom that you are going to share with us today in the context of autoimmune brain disorders. But before we start with that, um, Craig, I'd love to know what you're passionate about in life right now. Yeah, this uh, really the combination of science, medicine, and uh, business of being able to take research and translate it into products that are acutely needed in the medical industry. Um, because if you think about it, um, there's a lot of research that goes on, but if you can't translate that into something that can help a person, um, it's just great research. And so my passion is to be able to take that information and that research and be able to uh, take it through the pathway that requires it to be approved and cleared and validated and then uh, apply it to acutely needed disorders such as what we're going to talk about today. Mm. And I think it's such an important point that we do need to bring these new pathways mm -hmm. into the medical profession because some of the pathways that we have currently um, certainly in the traditional medical approach, are not fit for purpose. And it's absolutely vital that we continue that research, we continue developing new products and new ways in which to serve people that the, the current modalities are not doing. And I, I'd love to know, in the context of autoimmune disorders, what, what inspired you to get into this field in the first place? What was the catalyst? Yeah, actually, the um, connection, it was through my co-founder, Dr. Madeline Cunningham, uh, who's been doing research for many decades into uh, immunity and streptococcal infections. And she came to me with a problem and said that uh, there are a lot of uh, patients who are asking to get into a clinical study in which they were looking at a sudden onset of various types of obsessive compulsive disorders, neuropsychiatric disorders, but they were all preceded by a strep infection. And that got me very curious about what is it in um, this particular uh, biological process that is causing that. And uh, she had some answers there, but no way of really being able to get it out into the use for the public or for the medical community. And that's what began this particular company is when we found out that how much these patients were suffering uh, in the medical community, mm. and often they've seen between five and 15 doctors, but they ever really found out what was really wrong with them. Um, so that was the beginning of this particular journey for this company. But I, I would say probably as you asked her earlier, um, Dr. Reef was that, you know, the passion um, that drives this is um, being an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. I also still teach entrepreneurship uh, part-time because it's really through thinking about and envisioning what can be in the future that all of these different things come into being, but someone has to be able to actually see them and be able to then assemble a group of people and do what needs to be done in order to lead it into a direction that will allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. And do you know, I think no, there's no time where it's more important for having the entrepreneur entrepreneurial mindset in the context of medicine mm -hmm. because it has in my from my perspective I think it's become quite stagnant mm -hmm. and stuck in its ways and uh, in certain fields particularly in in the context of 
of, of this field and autoimmune disorders and we're not really getting the this you know the shift that is needed to to care for patients and clients that are really struggling and it you know i i have my own my own clients and obviously similar experience in them having seen multitude of different doctors um before they get an answer to understand the underlying root cause of their symptoms rather than the um doctors that they're seeing or the professionals they're seeing just focusing on the symptoms and not seeking to uh, understand the root cause and become a get get curious around why they're presenting the symptoms that they're presenting and, and not just treating the symptoms themselves. Right. And unfortunately, uh, medicine does change rather slowly and there are good, good reasons for that. But part of what uh, causes this particular area to be more, um, let's say, uh, delayed in the diagnosis and treatment is that it crosses multiple disciplines. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Classically, doctors can be trained in specialties such as psychiatry, which is different from being trained in immunology or neurology or maybe infectious disease. Mm -hmm. But these types of disorders that we're referring to actually cross all of those disciplines. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, patients get referred to uh, different disciplines. And so it does uh, take uh, individuals in the practice of medicine who are saying, let's see if we can find the root or at least look for the root um, because this particular patient is not seeming to improve in a normal way in which we mm -hmm. would expect that. Yeah, and I, and I think it's so important that, you know, as you mentioned, and I know you're gonna do a presentation very shortly to bring this to life, it is taking a much more system-centric approach mm -hmm. to how we deal with the presentation of symptoms that people have because there can be many underlying root causes that could be through a multitude of different avenues within our body and not necessarily originating from the mind but it's the mind that's or the brain that's been impacted um, as a result of of other issues outside outside the brain and often we you know obviously my focus is brain health we forget uh, some people forget that the brain is actually attached to the rest of the body um, and it, it it drives um, the rest of the body to, to a certain degree, not, not to, in totality. And so we have to look at that whole system and how the whole system is impacted. And that's so important. So before we dive into your presentation, um, and I, I would love for people who are listening and watching is to post any questions, please do that in the chat um, below if you have any questions for, for Craig, and we'll seek to answer them at the end, but hopefully we'll answer them throughout um, the presentation. Um, before we dive in, I'd love to know what does optimal brain health mean for you personally in the context of your journey? Well, that's a really great question because um, sometimes we think of um, the difference between the brain and the mind. So the brain is obviously the organ, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which is we have many other organs. The mind is really sometimes we think of separately but um, they're very well, they're connected. In other words, you know, the health of the brain it, it impacts your mind, your mental health, your mental being, your state of being. And, and this involves both physical, uh, mental, and even spiritual. And I think that these things which impact any of those areas of our body, if we don't eat properly or if we're taking medications or things that impact our brain and will impact our mind, and if we also don't uh, maybe exercise as much or do the things that will help and physically do affect that. The other is our emotional and well-being. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, the turmoil in the world, if um, we expose ourselves to too much and constant different types of, of inputs, it's going to affect the state of our mind because mm -hmm. neurotransmitters in our brain tend to form neural pathways in which we tend to get in these ruts of thinking certain ways. And then of course, there's a spiritual side of it. And that is the well-being of what you believe in, in um, your spiritual health and things that will actually help you become a better person, you know, the conscious part of our, our, our mind. So I think having uh, a good um, routine and a mechanism for actually dealing with each of those areas, because many of those could be the cause or the root cause of the impact. And if we 
treat just the symptoms or things that maybe are not necessarily the root, we might get some improvement, but typically you won't see the complete restoration of what you mm. brain health. Yeah, and I really just want to thank you for introducing the four quadrants of well-being as the way that we frame it as looking at your emotional, physical, your mental and your spiritual, because so often people only look at three out of the four mm -hmm. and they forget the importance, often the importance of our emotional state mm -hmm. and how our emotions are driving our behaviour or, or, or our past trauma that we may have experienced is affecting our emotional state. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they often forget the spiritual aspect, mm -hmm. that importance of understanding what is it, what is valuable to us, what we value, what our core values are, our purpose and our passion uh, and our belief system. And, and also the, you know, how we connect with the world around us and how we connect with ourselves is so important. And it can all have a huge impact on how we perform in the context of our brain health. So so thank you so much for, for bringing that um, into play there. Um, I know we're going to do a presentation, but before we start the presentation, I'd love for you to just contextualise what an autoimmune brain disorder is for those that are listening and particularly for any parents who, you know, may have these concerns that perhaps um, their child or themselves maybe um, as a child had mm -hmm. an autoimmune brain disorder but and they're still suffering, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not getting any answers to to, to their symptoms through, through traditional roots? Yeah, so that's a, um, an important, uh, really quite a question because uh, people don't necessarily think of autoimmunity as it affects the brain. Um, the brain really is the last frontier in medicine, meaning if we yeah. go back, uh, you know, not too far in the history, uh, a lot of how what may be with thought of mental or neuropsychiatric disorders were handled where people were either locked up and even before that they were sterilized and then there was this part of time when even lobotomies were considered. With the advent of neuropsychiatric drugs, it is one of the first lines of treating any type of neuropsychiatric behavioral or mental disorders. But when we talk about these different types of disorders, they're all diagnosed and classified based on symptoms. So, it, for instance, if you have motor or vocal tics, which is a neurologic um, disorder, it, it's classified uh, as if you have it for longer than 12 months as Tourette syndrome, uh, ADD or ADHD with uh, anxiety and other types of behavior associated with that could be diagnosed with uh, ADD or ADHD. And so it does not have anything to do with the underlying root. So. Mm -hmm of that is what is the root because there can be neurologic there can be psychiatric there can be autoimmune as you described and so what more and more research is identifying and COVID is helping to understand that is the connections between infections our immune system and our neuropsychiatric or our brain mm. uh, and how the interconnection so what what happens is uh, every one of us get infections, but these infections in certain people trigger certain uh, autoantibodies that are directed against parts of the infection that look exactly like parts of our body. And so when it looks like part of our brain, those antibodies shouldn't be made because our body has a way of, of regulating self versus non-self. But when they happen, and individuals then um, get these infections and they make these cross-reactive or what we call autoimmune antibodies, they will then cross the blood-brain barrier and interfere with the normal function of the brain, in particular a place called the basal ganglia, which mm -hmm. controls um, emotions, cognition, uh, motor movements, eye movements, and various other areas of, of the body. And so when you see that happening in patients, um, you can't tell the difference between something that's of traditional psychiatric origin or something that's autoimmune. The problem is that if they're all treated with the traditional psychotropic drugs, often those patients not only won't respond, uh, and sometimes they'll be called treatment resistant, but in many cases they might even get worse. And so this is what 
the importance of is looking for what's the underlying root and then treat the root of the condition, which is what we call an infection-triggered autoimmune con neuropsychiatric condition. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to explore the trigger because obviously um, we, we're looking at it both in the context of children uh, and the trigger can happen in childhood and it could even happen, um, I'm assuming, uh, from a birthing experience where they, they've um, had an a autoimmune response um, from, from perhaps an infection that they've contracted during the birthing experience. Mm -hmm. um, and then you may get a multitude of different infections, but ultimately your immune system, your primary, there's two responses, isn't it? You kind of have a primary response mm -hmm. uh, to, to an infection and a secondary response, which is much, much more significant. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, the, it's the secondary response, the secondary interaction of your immune system that creates these antibodies that can, can become um problematic if they cross the blood brain barrier so could you just talk about the often the root causes that may happen in child we'll start with childhood because that's mm -hmm. often where it may start what typical um root causes of an autoimmune disorder may 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 be in the in the context of children yeah there, there's um one maybe i should say in the last several decades a term that's called pandas or pans and mm -hmm. pandas stands for pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with a strep infection. And that's a particular diagnosis that's related to children, sudden onset, and a strep infection. Mm -hmm. The term PANS, which is pediatric uh, acute onset neuropsychiatric disorder, includes still children, but is related to any infection, such as Lyme, or Babesia, Bartonella, any other infection. So um, have people have to remember that some of these terms have specific medical diagnostic criteria. So even though maybe an adult may have those same symptoms, they can't have pandas or pans, mm -hmm. but they may respond to uh, the same treatments that a pandas and pans child would. So in those children, uh, pandas and pans, um, it's been described as a sudden onset of uh, some type of obsessive compulsive uh, disorder or restrictive food intake, which is typically an obsession about food contamination or fear mm -hmm. of choking. Uh, other types of symptoms such as anxiety, separation anxiety, uh, other types of behaviors that are listed in the diagnostic criteria. And it is triggered by a, an infection that uh, occurs, as I mentioned, where the immune system is slightly dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And when it is slightly dysfunctional, it can't tell the difference between self and non-self and allows those antibodies that are common to those particular parts of your body to be made. And then the immune cells will begin producing these antibodies and then cross the blood brain barrier and interfere with the brain. So we think of um, these, and we don't think of these as strange when antibodies attack our joints, we call it um, rheumatoid arthritis. When it attacks our uh, thyroid, we call it Hashimoto's. When it attacks our pancreas, we call it diabetes type one. Um, what we're talking about here are antibodies that actually are made and attack parts of the brain, in particular, some of the targets that we test for in our clinical laboratory. Mm -hmm. And I think it's such an important point here is that it could be not just one infection, but it could be a multitude of different infections. Um, and it, it may not necessarily be triggered by one. Is that correct? You, it could be you get a later infection that because of your immune, autoimmune system has become um, heightened, mm -hmm. that, that it triggers this response. Is that correct? It, it is, and um, there is more research uh, being understood about how our genetic predisposition to uh, this immune dysfunction, coupled with multiple infections, can uh, allow these antibodies to be made. Uh, and so what we find in the patients that typically are uh, autoimmune neuropsychiatric uh, infection triggered it's not just one infection, but it's multiple infections. Mm -hmm. And many of these infections can be subclinical, uh, meaning that the patient may not necessarily exhibit symptoms for infection that you might think. So for instance, the strep infection, 
everybody gets strep infections, um, can occur really in any orifice of the body. And uh, strep itself um, has multiple different types of forms. Um, but often when the immune system is, let's say, compromised, um, they may be more susceptible to mycoplasma mm -hmm. or babesia or Bartonella or other types of infections. And the goal would be to uh, eradicate um, all of the causative agents that are triggering these uh, autoantibodies. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to explore, because I'm so interested in the root causes and how our lifestyle is influencing the increased level of incidence of this. Uh, in children and also in adults, what what are the um, if we start from ingestion, um, what what are the typical root causes uh, when we think about the gut, our gut health, that increase that perhaps increase the risk of uh, contracting a infection and triggering a, an unexpected autoimmune response that that could lead to an autoimmune disorder. Mm -hmm. Well, you had mentioned the gut health, and certainly the more research has been understood about the microbiome and mm -hmm. how um, the commensal bacteria or the normal bacteria uh, that live in our body, and in many cases actually outnumber the cells uh, of our body, um, are important for producing different types of chemicals and different types of protective agents in our body. So if that's altered, um, often you can see some type of what people will call dis gut dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. um, there's been research that have identified, for instance, like in autistic children, um, that the microbiome within those children uh, are different from normal children and also narrower in the spectrum of the type of bacteria uh, that are available. So um, gut health is very important. Um, we don't study as much in the microbiome. So we do know that um, there are many practitioners who uh, advocate the healthy gut, healthy brain, mm -hmm. and um, I would defer to them for their particular types of modalities that they use for that. But um, what you eat actually does impact uh, your health. And I think yeah. you even mentioned for your own story um, that uh, it is important what we what we choose to eat because not only can it infect our health, but um, there are things that potentially people can be allergic to, or they can cause food allergies, which do stimulate also then what's called uh, endothelial lining in, in um, the blood system, which mm -hmm. also is the same and similar endothelial lining that protects the brain from uh, other things getting inside and into the brain. Mm. And I'd love to explore what you've just mentioned is the blood brain barrier, which is such an important barrier to pro protect us from having the um, protagonists cross into into our brain cells or into our brain as a whole. What what is it that from your experience is common that uh, increases the leakiness or maybe we call it dysbiosis of the blood brain barrier? that perhaps we didn't have historically, because I know there's aspects in the, from a lifestyle perspective in our current world um, state it, it, that we that we have significantly shifted um, how, how our blood brain barrier might be working. Would you, would you mind saying anything about that? Um, sure, uh, the, uh, you know, one of the biggest um, contributors to it uh, is stress. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the stress that people uh, take with them and continue to take, um, because as as our mind thinks about things that are stressful, uh, it does elicit, uh, in many cases, when it's very traumatic, fight or flight syndrome, which releases cortisol, which also impacts how uh, our body and our blood system uh, in, um, works, because it takes blood away from uh, areas that we don't need, like digestion, and then it moves it to our muscles and things where it thinks that we're going to need to do things in order to maybe um, avert a catastrophe. But over time, if you continue to do that, uh, it does begin to Im impact your gut. Um, there's also the the acronym or the the, um, the saying that a leaky gut, a leaky brain, uh, in anything that may impact the gut um, may tend to impact um, the lining, which is in the endothelial cells uh, of the brain. So um, 
some of this uh, has to do with just good, healthy diet. Mm -hmm. uh, things that uh, are important. Um, there's also some studies and research about um, not only probiotics, um, but fermented foods, um, those that have normal, healthy uh, organisms that help repopulate and replenish that in the gut. Uh, and then, um, you know, staying away as much as you can from junk food, which <laughs> a lot of processed food and things like that, uh, you know, our body was not never really meant to be able to see that constantly. Yeah. So, so overall health is important and I probably wouldn't be the best expert to talk about that, but I would say that, um, it is very important to be aware of what you put into your body and uh -huh. the things that you continue to eat because it will impact, but not to forget about the stress or parts because kind of like a cauldron, uh, all these different things, including toxins, heavy metals, mold, um, stress, and at some point, your body just is unable to keep up with protecting yourself. Yeah. And I, I think that's a really important point is that it's not necessarily just one thing that is going to cause a, a decline or a, a, a leaky um, blood brain barrier. But it is the attack from many different things, which in isolation might not look like a big deal. But when you collectively stack it up, your body doesn't have any reserve to to deal with the onslaught that it's experiencing. And that's when it starts to break down. Yeah. So you can even think about more recent um, what is called long COVID, mm -hmm. uh, which is really a result of the immune system and the infection from SARS-CoV-2, which triggers uh, the immune system and the immune dysfunctional response to it. And in some cases, um, you see these autoantibodies that occur that are against your brain, against your cardiovascular system, resulting in what people tend to call brain fog, um, the inability to, to think, cognitive dysfunction. And um, it's uh, quite pronounced. And in, in many cases, you know, it, we see that it's um, many, many months, years uh, that take people to recover in those cases. Um, so it's another illustration of an infection triggered autoimmune, uh, in this case, resulting in cardiovascular, neuropsychiatric and other types of symptoms. And I think that, you know, it, important to note there also that it may not just attack your brain. <laughs> it, it can attack other organs in your body, but the presentation in your brain might present as a psychiatric disorder. Whereas actually the underlying root cause is, it is, is, an, is an infection. So I'd love to dive in to a little bit more to the science behind how it all works mm -hmm. um, and, and talk about molecular mimicry, yeah. if, you, if you wouldn't mind. Do you want to dive into your presentation or are you happy to keep, keep talking as we are? I'm happy to go either way. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and do that? Because that will probably explain some okay, of Okay, let's do yeah. that. Yeah. So this first slide here is one that maybe summarize what I was mentioning. There is a connection between infections, our immune system and our brain function. But as you can see in the middle, it's tied through a genetic predisposition. Um, there's an article that was published a couple years ago in uh, JAMA Psychiatry, which is one of the very uh, well-respected journals uh, in the medical field. Um, the dentist uh, looked at a study of over a million uh, patients who, uh, from birth to age 18 in Denmark, uh, they found out that if a patient was hospitalized for a severe infection between some time during that uh, time frame, that they were 80% more likely to develop uh, various types of neuropsychiatric disorders that included schizophrenia, bipolar, chronic depression, ADD, ADHD, and many others. So there's this uh, genetic predisposition of an immune dysfunction. People will get infections. The immune system will do what it normally does in developing both uh, what we call the innate and the adaptive immune response, which includes auto antibodies, inflammation, and many other parts of it. But in those patients, it goes a little awry and then through what we just described about the circulation of these antibodies that actually will cross the blood-brain barrier uh, will interrupt normal function and will manifest as these neuropsychiatric symptoms so in the next slide what you can see here is what i just described here 
is that we all get these infections. Every, every one of us get these infections and our body produces these antibodies, which is really why vaccination has come about, which has been successful in smallpox and other types of diseases because it allows the body to take the time, which is generally four to six weeks, to develop these antibodies um, that will protect in a future infection. Now, if we go back to the dysfunctional part of it, is the body can produce an antibody against any type of what we call an antigen that it has ever been created, developed, seen, because it has an unlimited ability or a, a, an enormous repertoire of being able to combine different uh, genes together. Now, that means it also can combine genes that make antibodies that look like uh, our liver, our pancreas, our brain. But it goes through training and it says, these are me, don't make these. Well, in these certain patients, that training is dysfunctional, which mm -hmm. allows those antibodies to then be made and they cross-react in this case with the neurologic receptors through a process we call molecular mimicry. And the molecular mimicry is just a, a, a process that's been around where there's only 20 letters of the protein alphabet and bacteria and viruses use the same or similar 20 letters. And at some point in their gene or their protein alphabet, there's a sequence that's similar to a part of our body. And our body is not supposed to make antibodies against those. But when it does, we call it molecular mimicry. You might think of molecular mimicry um, in that sense. And then if they cross the blood-brain barrier, they began attacking normal tissue. And if you think about friendly fire in the wartime, um, where the good troops can't be distinguished from the enemy troops because of maybe indistinguishable different types of maybe colors. This is a similar mechanism that occurs with these cross-reactive antibodies. Mm -hmm. and so your soldiers that are fighting an infection that you had in your body think that your brain, when it's crossed the blood-brain barrier, is also the infection and so starts fighting your brain as uh, perceiving it as, as the infection that it started to fight in the first place that was in your body. Exactly. And you, you see that in rheumatoid arthritis, you see this mm -hmm. in you see this in MS. And typically the current treatments are to suppress the immune system. Because although we need the immune system, their particular immune system has uh, gone awry. Um, there are better drugs coming out that are more specific, but uh, the current way in which many of these are tackled is by just suppressing the entire immune system, which is why they give warnings about people being susceptible to other infections, but they may not then be suffering from this other type of arthralgic pain or other things associated with these autoimmune conditions that people are familiar with. In this condition, it happens to be those particular parts of the brain, um, dopamine receptors, lysoganglioside, um, some other types of stimulatory components that we measure in our in our testing. And if it's directed against those, we'll see these neuropsychiatric symptoms that include the anxiety, the aggression, the rage, the OCD, depression, et cetera. But what needs to have happened is they need to then be able to address those underlying infections and the immune system rather than the psychiatric symptoms. Although sometimes you have to manage those, but long term, that's not the solution. Hmm. And I think that's a really important point is, you know, obviously the traditional approach is suppressing the immune system, but actually that doesn't deal with the root cause of the problem, which is the fact that your body's attacking itself. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does provide some temporary relief to that. And, and often um, individuals um, get relief from that. Um, and this is why it's important for research to continue at advance and build and create better drugs that are more specific, meaning they're just targeting just that particular part that's being made rather than the whole immune system. Mm -hmm. And that will happen. That will occur, but it will take time. And, mm -hmm. and that would be the, the best answer. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I'd love to know in, in the context of the 
the clients that you've treated or the patients that you've treated that come in, have come into into your clinic what has been um what have you noticed as the as the common presentation that people come in with if you can if you can say that or could you share some stories uh, yeah. around the support that you've given to help people recover from these disorders yeah so um often um what you see is in, in many cases this sudden or abrupt onset it might be gradual uh let's say it's a child let's say you know, my child was normal, and then now they have separation anxiety, they have rage and anger, uh, they're unprompted, and then have even maybe suicidal ideation, which mm -hmm. is also not uncommon in, in these types of disorders. Um, and they have not been able to be responsive to any kind of neurologic or psychiatric medication. That's typical of what we see. Um, they may end up with uh, weight loss that uh, is related to an OCD or a food phobia, meaning they're afraid the food is contaminated, hand washing behavior, fear mm -hmm. of uh, other types of contamination, uh, afraid of being left alone um, at an unusual age that you wouldn't expect that, separation anxiety, uh, mm -hmm. chronic depression. So if you think about it, that part of the brain controls so many different emotional and cognitive functions that if you interrupt that with an antibody that interrupts the normal signal, then you can have a whole host of what we call heterogeneous um, manifestations, which is makes this difficult to diagnose just by symptoms because they might have maybe three out of the 15 symptoms and they might be different from another person that has five out of the 20 symptoms. And therefore, how could these actually be similar root causes? Mm. And that's part of the challenge. Yeah, and I think another one you mentioned earlier as well is the heightened uh, sense of taste and smell, is that right? Yeah, there could be sensory abnormalities, things that actually uh, impact um, your uh, sensitivity to different stimuli, because again, we're talking about neurologic components. And these are the targets that we look at uh, in what we've named and called the Cunningham panel, which mm -hmm. is a blood test that takes blood from a patient. And then we look at, are there antibodies present that are directed against those particular targets in the brain? Mm -hmm. And and I know that you can do this globally. Certainly from within the UK, you you have a uh, set up with the AONM, uh, and also you do it obviously stateside. So people who are listening, <laughs> it, it it is accessible, um, and you do have a, a fast um, uh, uh, postal system <laughs> to get the tests done very quickly. Yeah, um, so you're not restricted. Uh, per se to to get the right test for using the Cunningham panel. Yeah, so we we are also a clinical laboratory that has all the accreditations that uh, specimens come from literally all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, AONM group, which is based there in, in London, is our trusted partner who uh, helps in uh, the whole process of uh, with the doctor, the patients with the uh, collection, the transport, and help in any way with uh, guidance on interpretation, and they'll also connect with us. So um, their website is listed, as you see it scrolling across mm -hmm. the, um, the image there. Um, they're very, uh, very, very effective and very helpful. And we would encourage people, if they want more information, there's a website they have that also has some more in-depth talks about this, uh, about a little bit more about our panel and what what the uh, results are and what they mean. Um, but we would encourage you to look at their website and uh, listen to the other webinars uh, mm -hmm. and reach out to them if anybody thinks that this could be someone that they're thinking about or maybe a doctor who needs to know about it. Could you share some um, patient stories? We'll put all of those links in the in the show notes, and as you can see, they're 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 there below as well. So, could you share some um, stories from some uh, patients that you've had that have come into your clinic? Absolutely, and maybe if you move over to slide six, I think that there this is a, a really good illustration of a picture of one of our patients, of whom we have hundreds and hundreds of 
that have shared their stories with us. Um, this individual was diagnosed at eight years old with a mental disorder, which is kind of unusual to think. Um, she had been wanting to kill herself. The parents couldn't figure out what was going on. They emptied their 401k out twice. They couldn't find any answers. Um, and that was a snapshot of a video that uh, the mother sent to us. And they found out about us and we tested her and uh, that changed her treatment completely. And uh, more recently, as she's grown up, the mother sent her us a picture of her saying that she's back to normal life and completely well. This is one of hundreds. Um, I can think of a couple of others that um, people have sent to us and doctors have, have shared with us. A 15-year-old girl who was diagnosed with schizophrenia was uh, put inside and out and in and out multiple times uh, into a treatment facility. Uh, they, she was given the standard psychiatric drugs for schizophrenia, and they diagnosed her as treatment-resistant schizophrenia, meaning that there was not much else they could do for her. Mm -hmm. Called in an immunologist at a, at a well-respected hospital. This immunologist heard about us. Um, they ordered a panel, found out that she had autoantibodies against four of the five targets. They changed her treatment <clears throat> to something that removed the autoantibodies. And within two weeks, they said that she was back home playing tennis, normal, and then off of all of the psychiatric meds. Wow. So some of these stories are really, really dramatic. And they're amazing to hear because uh, many of these patients have suffered for long, long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's astonishing, isn't it, that, you know, how, you know, you mentioned the parents ent uh, emptying their 401k out twice, uh, spending all of the investments that they've made to to help their child. And actually, when they get the right treatment um, plan and you understand what the root cause are, causes are in the context of infection, the, the change can be quite dramatic mm -hmm. um, for the child. And, and, um, and the fact that they're off the medication, mm -hmm. which is obviously for, for many people has masked the symptom rather than address the root cause. And I, it just makes me wonder uh, how many children and how many adults out there that have ha had an infection at, 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 when they were a child or even more recently are being medicated um, and not achieving any relief because they actually have an underlying autoimmune um, disorder. Could you mention anything about the, um, the reasons why med medicine itself can take so long mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to affect any change? Yeah, and if you go back one slide, I think this might be historically important. Mm -hmm. So um, infection triggered autoimmune conditions are not new. Um, in fact, a rheumatic fever is a diagnosis that was uh, a strep infection where antibodies were uh, attacking the heart valve and uh, it's called rheumatic fever, acute rheumatic fever, and it's treated with penicillin and it's known to be caused by a strep infection. Uh, patients who have rheumatic fever, uh, one of the neurologic manifestations of rheumatic fever is what was called, and still is, Sydenham's chorea. And Sydenham chorea, um, which is described in the 1800s and even, even in the 1600s, um, that the patients would end up with these abnormal movements, loss of fine motor control, loss of emotional control, uh, back then, it was called St. Vitus's Dance because of these choreiform movements and these piano you know, playing movements and the different types of dance-like movements that they couldn't control their body, which is more of the tick and the motor tick types of things. So um, you're right. Medicine changes rather slowly. Uh, it is recognized that these are autoimmune responses of a strep infection, and today they're treated routinely. Um, not so much more. We don't see it as much in the United States and, and, and uh, other developed countries, but we do see it more in other countries. And uh, penicillin is just the standard treatment for that. Um, so what takes a while in medicine to understand is that 
these types of what maybe they're called medical models um, can be applied to other things that we call these complex disorders. Now, again, it's not every patient that has these symptoms uh, are autoimmune. In fact, um, we don't know what percentage, um, but it's very important in what we call precision medicine to mm -hmm. find out what the underlying root and treat the root rather than treat everybody the same way um, because the one size does not fit all and patients then um, don't respond to that. Could you, could you describe, Craig, the typical journey that your patients um, go on when they, they come to you with a presentation um, that may have you know, been through fifth, four to 15 uh, professionals previously? Yes, um, because um, we're a small company and we really don't have what people think of like a pharmaceutical company, traditional salespersons or education. They have to really be looking for us uh, because part of uh, what we do is we're funded by uh, investments and even donors and things like that. Um, so the patients typically will have a journey of sometimes, as mentioned, uh, it could be between three to seven years uh, post starting a symptom and then seeing between five and 15 doctors and not improving or in some cases getting worse. And Typically, it's the parents in the case where it's children that are searching on the internet for answers to uh, unresolved or um, different types of symptoms that are not remedied by treatment, and they'll come across to us. Or some of the doctors will hear when we give presentations at medical conferences, and then they will order a test. And uh, on the two slides down, slide number seven, um, once they end up ordering a test, those are the five targets within the test, then they recognize and see that, oh, this patient has a couple of autoantibodies directed against a couple of parts of their brain. Therefore, um, I'm going to look at uh, things that might indicate there's other infections to be treated and some type of thing, some type of medication that will either uh, reduce the inflammation or uh, affect the immune system, and there's medications for that. Mm -hmm. uh, doctors will also include naturopathic medicines uh, to help improve this, but typically the treatment will change. And then once the treatment is changed and they see that the patients begin to improve or get better, then they recognize this is the underlying root and they will continue until that patient gets well. So. Mm -hmm can be, as I mentioned, anywhere from three to seven years. And then sometimes it's even decades. And so wow. we need that too. Wow. And, and then obviously in terms of the recovery period, you, you mentioned obviously really fast recovery is to, can, can be as quick as two weeks. What's the, the typical or the sort of typical recovery journey that, that, that your patients go through? Yeah, it's uh, often patients that uh, are diagnosed very early, meaning their immune system has not been set in for very long, within mm -hmm. maybe a couple of months or less, they respond fairly quickly to things that treat the uh, infection or treat the immune system, and you see some rapid improvements. Unfortunately, the, the typical and average patient is not identified early, so uh, they may see some type of improvement um, within, you know, a few weeks, a month, and, and know that this is the first time that they've ever, ever been able to experience that. And then the doctor will continue on in that manner until they find a combination of immune modulators, anti-infectives, anti-inflammatories that will uh, get the patient back to what we'll call baseline. Mm -hmm. So the longer that the immune system is stimulated over time, the stronger the immune response is and the longer it takes uh, for patients to improve. So it could be sometimes journeys as long as many, many months, but there's a, some kind of constant improvement versus being on the psychiatric meds and nothing changes. In fact, maybe it's getting was getting worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important that people... Um, learn about yourself and the and the tests that you do so that they can get the right medical support um that they need in order to recover 
from an autoimmune disorder and bring their immune system back into a a, a calmer state. <laughs> so it's yeah. it's not we're not having our body attacking ourselves. Yeah. So if you go to the last slide, there um, there's some contact information. Um, and as I mentioned, the Academy of Nutritional Medicine um, is uh, our trusted partner there. Um, they have access to the Cunningham panel. They have uh, the website, the uh, information on pandas and pans and other webinars. So again, um, this would be the place to go because I know you're located in the UK. Yeah. And um, they work very, very closely with us. Uh, and their goal is the same as ours, uh, changing how medicine is practiced for those mm. suffering from these neurological and psychiatric behavior disorders. And I know Gillian um, Crowther, who's at the um, uh, Association uh, Ac Academy of Nutritional Medicine, put me in touch with yourself too, and she's an absolute wonderful um, person, and certainly I would really encourage people who are UK-based to reach out um, to the ONM um to to look at all the videos that you you yourself have done along alongside many other professionals in this space to better understand um mm. autoimmune disorders and how that presents itself craig what um i know we uh, open out for questions now but but before we close if anyone's got any questions that's online live please just post them in the in the chat what one piece of advice would you give to anybody whether it's a parent um, that has a child that's struggling and they're not getting the resolution or, or an adult that doesn't feel that the drugs that they're, they've got are working for them neurologically, what one piece of advice would you give to anyone who, who is struggling and thinks that this could maybe be the root cause? Yeah, um, it would be not to give up because um, it's through the parents or the persistence or perseverance in spite of differences of maybe even and, and sometimes it's the medical community who just doesn't understand there are other doctors out there who recognize this and doing your own searching doing your own um, research finding and getting in contact with us and AONM and others if you think that this could be the situation we have seen just dramatic uh, changes in uh, individuals who may have been suffering like I said for 10 20 20 mm. years more um, but it is through the perseverance and persistence of someone who cares for the patient whether it's the parent or family member um, and not giving up hope uh, and continuing to look until they find answers because they typically know this is not my child or this is not the way i used to be and I, i'm going to find an answer uh, and the answer is out there and mm. that's um, the message of hope, and that's part of what our mission is, uh, to give hope and healing to those suffering from these disorders. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that's such an important point, is there is always hope. Never assume that, you, that, that you're at the end of the line. There's always another avenue that you can explore, whether it's this avenue or something else, but reach out to the, to keep reaching out to people who, who can support you. And I do encourage um, those that are listening and, and those that are watching um, whether live or otherwise, is to go to um, your website um, if you want to introduce you, how pe how people can best get hold of you. I know it's showing up on on the slide visually, but for those that are listening, yes, uh, the www.molecularlabs.com. We also have a whole uh, wealth of resources there uh, that you can look at and identify and learn, uh, and uh, we're also happy to help. Also. Yeah, so do re do please do reach out to the ONM Molecular Labs, um, Dr. Craig Shimazaki or myself if you have any questions or concerns, and happy to to refer you on and and make sure that we give there is hope, uh, as Craig said, and and that there's always another way to look at things from a different perspective. And um, Craig, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for your time and being willing. Um, to go live. Remember, everyone, this show is all about brain health, unchaining your pain. You're not stuck with the brain you have. You have the power to make radical changes and to solve your symptoms that you're experiencing. And Craig has kindly been here to show you how. Thank you, Craig. 
Thank you, Dr. Allen, for the work that you're doing because getting the word out and educating people that there is hope and there are answers and being able to provide that to people is such a needed and important mission. So thank you for having me on today. Oh, you're most welcome. If there's anything I can do to support you and your mission, and I'd love to partner with you going forward to help you bring this um, to the people here in the UK and my clients globally, um, mm -hmm. I'd love to do that because I think it's such an important um, subject matter that, is, that is, go, is going unaddressed at this present time. So thank you for all the work that you do. Yeah, there is one thing if anybody is interested, part of how we continue to do what we do is through um, both investments and investors, but also donors. And so it allows us to continue to provide testing, but also basic research to do exactly what we're talking about and share. So it's through that uh, and um, the empathy that people have say I, I really would like to help and be a part of that so um, that is something that people can also do brilliant lovely thank you thank you and I look forward to reconnecting very soon uh, thank you Dr. Allen it's a pleasure to talk with you today thank you